very much. And uh, we have such a good translator that you may want to listen to the Armenian rather than the English. Uh, so, uh, thank you uh, for coming out in this um, time of, um, well, I don't know if I call it abnormal time in Yerevan, but um, a different time in Yerevan when things are happening. Um, which reminds us once again of infrastructures of government and formations of government and how governments operate and endure. Uh, but uh, some a number of you were not here uh, for the first talk, and I want uh, simply to very quickly go over uh, some of the points that I had made. And that here you're looking at the six provinces of Western Armenia, uh, which were the center of the Armenian liberation movement of the 19th century and early 20th century. This is where it was thought that there ever was going to be an Armenian state. It would be in these areas. And as a matter of fact, in uh, 1914, uh, one of the reform plans uh, that, were, that was imposed on the Turkish government was to create two regions here, autonomous regions, uh, where Armenians could have uh, self, local self-rule uh, under the uh, auspices of a European inspector general. Of course, World War I destroyed that possibility and the hope that Armenians could have some degree of security and autonomy, not independence, but autonomy, um, was killed by the uh, war and the very rapidly thereafter the beginning of the Armenian genocide in 1915. So it was really a surprise in 1918, uh, when after there were two, as you know, two Russian revolutions in 1917, the first one called the Democratic Revolution, uh, which the Armenians, uh, Georgians, and Muslims of Caucasia uh, welcomed because they thought it was the end of czarist rule uh, and oppression and the beginning of democratic, uh, federative, uh, republic, uh, and all these peoples favored federation. Uh, they were very sympathetic with the concept of uh, Russian federation that included uh, Armenia with uh, and the Armenian regions with it. But if you look on the map to the to the right, you see where Yerevan uh, province was, and that was not a, really a focal point at all of the Armenian liberation movement. So it was a surprise in 1918 that it became the temporary capital of Armenia, not by choice, but by necessity, because the Armenians were left all alone. Their lands, um, all of Western Armenia was reoccupied uh, by the, the uh, Turkish army after the second Russian revolution in November of 1917, uh, and the beginning of a Russian civil war between pro-Soviets uh, and anti-Soviet armies uh, uh, the uh, Russian armies abandoned the Caucasus front. The Armenians were left by themselves to face the Turkish armies. They, in turn, were abandoned by their neighbors, the Georgians and the Muslims, who became Azerbaijanis, uh, who declared their own independence in May of 1918, uh, leaving the Armenians with very little choice but to also uh, declare that the Armenian provinces uh, in Caucasia were now to be administered by the Armenian National Council, uh, which ironically was, if you look north of Yerevan, you see Tiflis. This was a major Armenian intellectual, cultural, and political center of the Caucasus, much like Constantinople was the economic, cultural, and political center of the Ottoman Empire. So these are areas extraterritorial, Armenian center, extraterritorial, and the Armenians were reluctantly forced to leave their beloved city of Tiflis, uh, in which what became the Georgian capital, and to move southward to Yerevan. Um, during the war, the Armenian um, regiments helped the Russian armies. This was Antronik and uh, Dro, two of the regiment leaders, Armenian volunteer regiment leaders. And then in 1918, was the uh, uh, defense, uh, final last ditch defense uh, of uh, Eastern Armenia, uh, by, uh, led by a dictator, a uh, popular dictator, uh, Aram Manukyan, and by the regular Armenian uh, units, uh, that is detachments. There were Armenian 
uh, regiments uh, that had been formed out of the Russian army, and these were led by Foma or Tomas Nazarabekov, Nazarabekian, uh, the Sparabet, or the commander in chief of the Armenian military forces. But you see, Armenia uh, lost so much territory in achieving a peace with Turkey, uh, if it had not been possibly for those battles of, at Sadarabad and Bashabaram, it may be, I cannot say for sure, that the Turks would have gone all the way to Yerevan. Um, uh, on the other hand, they had other uh, things on their agenda as well. And in June of 1918, they recognized this very minuscule state, uh, a, a nuclear state, uh, around Yerevan and Echmiadzin and Lake Sevan, that was all it was, uh, maybe um, uh, 8,000 uh, square kilometers or, or, or so. And it was there that the re rebirth of Armenian statehood took place in what was not regarded as a happy moment uh, for the Armenians. It was a, a moment that was imposed uh, on them, but later, as we reinterpret it now, uh, we celebrate it as a restoration of Armenian statehood, because if that did not take place, we might not be standing here in this city today. Uh, the last Armenian defense really uh, did not take place here in Yerevan, but it took place in Baku, and in, uh, for the summer of 1918, uh, Armenian, uh, not a, Armenian party, the Armenian Nationalistic Party, a socialist Nationalist Party, uh, collaborated with the uh, communist uh, leader, Stefan Shahumyan, in the Baku Soviet. They defended uh, Baku for several months after the declaration of Armenian independence until finally uh, Enver Pasha's brother, whose name was Nuri Pasha, uh, was able to take Turkish armies and uh, Muslim forces into Baku, where the final massacre of Armenians that started with the genocide in the Ottoman Empire in 1915, now culminated in September 1915 with the uh, a murder uh, or uh, uh, massacre of thousands of Armenians in Baku and the flight of the others to Persia, to Iran, to uh, Krasnodar and uh, Astrakhan. The first Armenian Prime Minister was Hovhannes Kachasnani. Uh, who uh, was a well-respected uh, civic leader with uh, experience in civil life. He belonged to the party Tashnak uh, and was sort of their senior statesman. Uh, he became the choice to become uh, the fr first prime minister. He tried to create a coalition government with the other Armenian parties. The other parties were quite weak, but nonetheless, uh, he and the party Tashnak did not want to take on the responsibility all by themselves of trying to govern a country in utter turmoil, but he didn't succeed uh, because the conditions that were put down by the other parties um, were not acceptable. And finally, Kachasnadi transfers with his small cabinet to Yerevan in July uh, of 1918, that is two months after uh, independence had been declared. And meanwhile, it was Aram Manukyan uh, who was the popular dictator here uh, with Dro as the military leader that uh, tried to keep things under control. When, uh, uh, when uh, the cabinet came to Armenia, this is what they saw, uh, thousands upon thousands of orphans and refugees. In all, there were, in the Caucasus, there were nearly a half million Armenian refugees, not only from Western Armenia, but also from Kars. Uh, which had been occupied by the uh, Turkish armies. And this is the scene that they saw for months and how depressing it had to be, but uh, this little scene and multiplied thousands of times over. Uh, this was the Catholicos of the time, uh, Kevor Kingeror, George V, uh, who uh, tried to shelter the refugees from Vaughan, uh, like Arshil Gorky's family and others. Uh, at the time, and who was uh, truly a, a sorrowful uh, patriarch uh, of the time. Uh, and the speaker of the Armenian Khodrut, the first Armenian legislature that opened in August of 1918, Avedik Sahakyan. When uh, 
Jovanes Katjas Nune made his inaugural address to the Armenian legislature. He described the conditions in Armenia as ansev chaos. Ansev chaos meaning uh, chaos without form, chaos without boundaries, because it was so out of control. The situation was so uh, terrible that one couldn't say, oh, here's a boundary of what we have to do, because it was a, a boundless chaos that the challenge was for them to take that boundless chaos and then turn it into at least a, a chaos with form, where it, which had borders and boundaries and they knew what to do with. Um, but uh, Avedi Sahagyan, the speaker in uh, 1918, as he opened the parliament or legislature, he made an optimistic speech that by the, the, these narrow boundaries of the little republic that we see near Lake Sevan there would not last forever, and by the iron force of um, the will of the Armenian people that these boundaries would surely break and the republic would be able to expand. And at the end of World War I, by the Treaty of Mudros, that is the armistice of Mudros, when the Ottoman Empire uh, surrendered, one of the conditions was that they were going to withdraw back to the 1914 borders uh, between Turkey and uh, Russia. And so that meant that they had to leave Alexandropol, which, or Gumri today, which they had occupied, and they had to withdraw from the whole plain of Ara, which they had occupied for six months, and also from the entire province of Kars. They didn't withdraw from everywhere in Kars because they kept hidden uh, detachments uh, on the uh, Russian side of the frontier to uh, direct the uh, Kurdish and Turkish uh, uh, groups in there that did not want to recognize Armenian uh, in the, uh, independence and authority. And this uh, expansion to cars was with the support of the British military, which had occupied the railroad between Baku and, and Tiflis and Batum uh, uh, for security reasons, and had also sent a small detachment of Indian troops uh, who helped in expelling the Turkish armies from Kars, so that by the beginning of 1919, by the spring of 1919, the Armenian Republic had expanded from its initial 8,000 or so um, square kilometers, uh, it had tripled and quadrupled in size by its expansion, theoretically, uh, to the 1914 borders, uh, bringing it right next to the province of Erzurum, and right next to the province of Van, which were, uh, and it's by no uh, coincidence that thousands upon thousands of Western Armenians flowed into cars. Uh, you know how terrible it is to be a refugee, and they had been refugees for two, three years, and were 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 just uh, uh, starving to return. Uh, to their native lands, impatient and critical of the government for not arranging it for them to return uh, uh, very quickly in order to sow uh, the fields in time uh, for the crops to grow. Uh, uh, in um, the end of 1918 uh, was an interesting time because uh, it was a, a peri the only period of the Armenian Republic, uh, except for the last, very last week or two, that there was a coalition government in Armenia. Uh, the Armenian Jogurtagan uh, Party, uh, or the People's Party, or the, if you wish, the Democratic Party, Jogurtagan Party, well, was made up of liberals, intellectuals, bankers, professionals, uh, whose headquarters and what were in, was in Tiflis, and who had membership uh, among the professional classes in Baku and other areas. They represented the Armenian bourgeoisie. Uh, they represented those who had a great deal of expertise in the professions. And uh, they uh, expressed a willingness that after uh, Turkey had been defeated to uh, make... Uh, uh, a presence in the Armenian government by forming a coalition with the Tashnak Tuchun. They didn't like the Tashnak Tuchun. They're, they're uh, liberals, free enterprise uh, people 
who are very close in ideology to the Western Armenian Constitutional Democratic or uh, Rangavar Party. Uh, they, they had a lot in common, they were not exactly the same, but they represented the same kind of mentality that was represented among the Western Armenians by uh, Nubar Pasha, the uh, head of the Armenian national delegation, who had represented Armenian interests uh, with the major powers during World War I, uh, after he had been appointed by Katolikos Kivork uh, uh, to represent him and Armenian uh, interests there. Uh, these uh, uh, new ministers that came to uh, Armenia uh, at the end of 1918 were very uh, optimistic that they could help to change the situation. Samson Haratunyan uh, was probably the best known of him. He was a minister of um, uh, justice and he planned to revamp the entire judicial system of Armenia, of Armenia and um, uh, with, uh, with appellate courts, with supreme courts, uh, the, uh, uh, and eventually a trial by jury, which was uh, really a novelty here. There are re major challenges, even f with that plan, in that the entire judicial system was in Russian. And uh, there was a strong demand from Western Armenians in particular, but also from the uh, leaders of the Tashnak uh, that they should Armenianize the government gradually, but as soon as possible. And you can imagine what a challenge it would be to have to uh, find all the terminology, create the terminology in Armenian for all the Russian uh, uh, processes there. Uh, it was a major challenge. They had to have uh, commissions to create legal terms and also to study uh, the uh, legal practices of the Western Armenians, which were different in order to incorporate them. But he came with a great deal of enthusiasm, at, as did Atabekian, um, a populist minister, or Jovartagan, minister of education, who planned again for. Uh, uh, compulsory elementary education at least, and to a literacy campaign, uh, and pro hopefully eventually an Armenian university, which had been prohibited to the Armenians under uh, Russian Im uh, imperial uh, rule. Ardashis and Vyajan was a financial wizard and uh, came down to try to find a w way to establish a national currency, uh, a budgetary system of government, uh, a graduated income tax that's very progressive that as you pay according to the income that you have uh, and uh, so forth. In February of 1919, Enfiajan, the Jovartagan minister, joined Kachasnoni, the first prime minister, uh, to go abroad to try to secure funds. Uh, Armenia could never be financially secure and stable until it had valuta, until, until it had hard currency. And that hard currency uh, could not be generated here on this small territory. It had to come from outside. And both from the Armenian communities and the Armenian uh, merchants and business class abroad, uh, and more particularly from, uh, from non-Armenian industrial pursuits who uh, wanted to take a risk and invest in uh, Armenia. And so Kachosnani and Enfia uh, uh departed on a joint uh, mission to go to Europe and ultimately to the United States to secure funds. And in that uh, uh, interim, therefore, um, uh, Kachosnani had to give up uh, the premiership and handed it to his foreign minister. Here is Alexander Khatisyan. Khatisyan was an, um, a veteran uh, civic servant. He had served as the mayor of Tiflis for uh, many years. He had been the president of the cities, uh, Caucasian cities. He had numerous uh, uh, positions of this kind. Uh, he joined the, the uh, party Tashakshin only uh, after the first Russian Revolution, that is in 1917. Uh, maybe he found it. Uh, uh, proper to do so at that time, or fitting to do so at that time, because the Tashnakshin was the most uh, was the dominant party in the Caucasus and the Armenian National Council in Tiflis, uh, the uh, which which was the body 
that declared the independence of Armenia. Uh, it didn't even call it independence, but the self-governance of the regions of Armenia in 1918. Uh, the Tashtashtun had 18 seats and the other parties, six each, uh, but the Tashtashtun allowed itself, even though it was a dominant party, to have a minority. That was their 45 members of the National Council and the ARF, as it's known, the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, held 18 seats, still, I think, seeking some kind of collaboration. Uh, here we see Alexander Khatisyan, as I say, uh, a consummate uh, diplomat and uh, a, a very good uh, leader. I'm not sure always uh, the best leader uh, in some people's opinion for Armenia in its ansev chaos, in its, uh, it, its formless chaos, because he believed in gradualism, gradual change, evolutionary change, and not revolutionary change. And his opponent uh, was uh, a radical uh, in the party Thashashtun, whose name was Ruben Derminasian, who said these are revolutionary times, we have to take revolutionary action, we don't have time for all this pansy uh, parliamentary procedures of going through committees and, and debating and passing laws, but we need a dictator. Uh, and so within the party, there was really never uh, absolute cohesion and unity uh, on these uh, issues. Here on the left, you see Samson Harutunyan, uh, the um, Jogurtagan Ramgavar, a leader of, of, uh, the legislative, of the Judicial Department of Armenia through the winter of 1919 until uh, the middle of 1919, and to the um, uh, other man as a great intellectual, I think, uh, Arsham Khontkaryan, who was a socialist revolutionary. Socialist revolutionaries were very close to the Russian socialist revolutionaries. They believed in federation with Russia, they didn't think that Armenia on its own could survive and therefore favored, <coughs> uh, favored a, a close association with Russia. And as you know, the party Tashtashtun and the socialist revolutionaries in Russia were also very, uh, they're like sister organizations in that they base their philosophy on the peasant, unlike the Marxists who stress uh, the laboring class, the, the workers, the proletariat, uh, the SRs, as they're known, and the ARFers, uh, their, their policies are based on the peasantry, uh, and their programs are largely directed to the peasantry rather than to uh, an urban proletariat. Uh, we have to remember that throughout all this winter, the first winter of 1919, 1918, 1919, uh, there were not only the onset chaos uh, within the country domestically, but also on the borders, which were never fixed, were, which were not fixed borders. There, there were porous borders, and the claims uh, were um, uh, very contrasting. Uh, the man to, uh, the, to my left is um, Noi Ramashvili, uh, the Prime Minister uh, of Georgia, uh, which uh, was uh, uh, the, the head of the uh, Georgian Social Democratic Marxist Party, which led uh, the Republic of Georgia. Uh, he was a, a major intellectual, very well known in the international socialist movement, and uh, brought home all his internationalism to Georgia after the independence of Georgia and became its Prime Minister. And to the right is uh, Fatali Khan Khoisky, uh, the head of the uh, Musavat government of Azerbaijan. Both of those governments had uh, difficulties uh, with Armenia, and Armenia had difficulties with them, less fortunately with Georgia, although uh, they had significant border disputes over the northern regions here, uh, uh, what we call Borchalu, uh, including Lori, and next door, Achalkalak, or today we call Javak, or historically, Javacheti, or Javach, and Achalkalak. Uh, so that area was uh, in uh, contention between the Georgians and the uh, Armenians. The Georgians insisted that these areas were all a part of the province of Tiflis, 
under Tsarist rule, and they should remain a part of the province of Tiflis under independent rule uh, of Georgia. Uh, the uh, Azerbaijani, of course, conflict was all along the border, from Kazakh, uh, you know, not from, from Ichivan, uh, not far from Ichivan, all the way down to, to Ganja or Ganza, and, and down through Shushi and Karabakh and over to Gerusi or Goris, uh, and down to, to Nakhchivan and Julfa and Akulis, all these are, were in contention. Um, I did something wrong, okay. Um, here, um, here you can see uh, what the Azerbaijani claims in the Caucasus were in 1919. You see, uh, they had surrounded uh, all of Armenia with their claims to, uh, and left Armenia again, basically with the territory with which it had begin, begun its existence in 1918, just Yerevan and uh, the other area. The, the current, by the way, the, the current uh, Azerbaijani um, uh, publications uh, stress the fact that Azerbaijan gifted this little area to the Armenians so that they could have uh, a place to live. Uh, on the other hand, look what the Armenians claimed. Uh, they claimed uh, uh, th those same territories uh, in the Caucasus, all of the area of Ganzak and Karabakh and Zangazur and Nakhichevan, and westward also all the way up, you see, uh, they're claiming here all Borchalu uh, area and Akhal Kalak and Akhuzha, Ardahan, uh, all these areas that were claimed by the Georgians. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 this is simply showing the areas uh, uh, contested by uh, in Karabakh. Uh, now, in um, 1918, and very unfortunately, during the time of the coalition government, there actually was a short war between Armenia and Georgia. You know, these people had been neighbors for centuries, and I don't remember there having a war uh, at any other time, but in the end of 1918, when the Turkish armies that were in occupation of this area withdrew. Uh, there became tension between the Georgians and the Armenians as to who should take over uh, this territory. And in the second half of, 19, uh, uh, of December of 1918, uh, the Armenian claiming uh, that the Armenian inhabitants of um, Borchalu were being repressed by a Georgian military uh, launched uh, an invasion that was supported by the local population. We're talking places like today, the uh, Jalalovlu, uh, what is it today, Stepanakert? No, Stepanavan, Stepanavan, Bana, no, 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 Jalalovlu, no. So, these areas, and what happened is at the end of uh, 1918, uh, uh, the British intervened and uh, agreed that the Armenians should withdraw from the northern parts of Borchalu because they were moving as far as the Khram River. They wanted to get as far as the Khram River in, in Georgia, where there are a number of Armenian uh, towns and villages. And in the end, um, they created in the south, uh, southern half of Borchalu, a neutral zone. And this neutral zone um, is what we call Lori today, the region of, of Lori. Uh, and that area remained uh, under mixed Georgian-Armenian jurisdiction uh, until uh, the Sovietization of Armenia, uh, after which uh, Soviet Armenia, or the Ar Red Army, claiming that, again, the Armenians are being repressed here, did invaded Georgia. And this area became a part of Armenia and remains today a part of Armenia. But you can see it's relatively a small area of conflict. Uh, still, uh, during this period, Armenians, Georgians, and Azerbaijanis talked to each other. And if you look at this picture of a Transcaucasian conference of uh, the three peoples in 1919, you see, they all look almost the same. You can't, it's very hard to tell who's a Georgian, who's an Azerbaijani, and who's an Armenian. They, they came through the Russian imperial 
uh, educational system. Uh, they had a lot of uh, things in common. They dressed very similarly, and yet they are three people um, at war in, in many ways. And compared with today, um, it, it was a better situation that uh, Armenia had its diplomatic mission in Baku uh, with um, uh, uh, a, a full uh, diplomatic uh, service and the Azerbaijanis had their uh, uh, mission here in Yerevan, even though it was accused of uh, fomenting uh, Muslim unrest in the country. Um, let me go back here. Yeah. Now, let me uh, let me stop here. So, uh, under the under the coalition government, uh, I can only say that. Um, we have to say it was black and white. Uh, there was a lot that was still very, very difficult for the country. It was probably the worst winter in Armenian annals. It was super cold and blizzard with thousands of in Armenian, they say Anotevan, meaning, I guess, homeless. Homeless people in the streets, mostly Western Armenians. Uh, and they died like anything. I mean, probably between 100 and 200,000 people died right here of starvation, of freezing cold, of uh, cholera, and typhus. Uh, I sometimes want to add those 200,000 people to the number of Armenians who were killed in the genocide perpetrated in 1915 onward, because one of the stipulations of the United Nations Genocide Convention says that genocide is also creating conditions where life cannot be sustained. And when you drive people out of their country into a, a place where there's neither food nor shelter uh, for them, and they're going to die, I consider them to be victims as well of genocidal policies that were perpetrated by the Ottoman government. I don't know if anyone agrees with me, but I certainly believe that that qualifies because these people would have lived in their homes uh, safely drawn during the winter in wherever they came from uh, and, uh, and perished. Uh, there was um, good, some good news that the American Committee for uh, Armenian and Syrian Relief found itself here. The American government, which is not good in political or, politi or military support, is excellent in humanitarian aid and through the American Relief uh, uh, Administration was able to send surplus grain uh, to Batum and ultimately to reach Yerevan by April of 1919, uh, also with the Near East Relief as a private, uh, semi-official private organization, sending out support. Uh, and so uh, the Armenians have to be uh, always thankful uh, for that American aid, even though you also need to realize that it represented 2% or less than 2% of American foreign aid uh, at that same year. That is, they sent far more percentage-wise to Germany, to Austria, and other starving countries. But it, that 2% was sufficient to keep uh, the Armenians uh, alive uh, thereafter. So from that point of view, it was, it, it was, it, it was good. Uh, there, was, uh, there were numerous protests about the lack of um, order in the country, uh, bitter complaints about Khumpa beds. Uh, Khumpa beds are partisan chieftains. And in times of revolution, they're good people because they're sort of like uh, freedom fighters. But in times when you try to create a government, they create their own little 
uh, circle around them and they raid, uh, they don't listen to the law, they don't pay taxes and so forth. So uh, bitter complaints uh, to Aram Manugyan, who was the Minister of uh, Interior, about uh, taking control of these things. And the other complaint was uh, against the bureaucrats. Uh, and under Russian rule, everyone feared and hated the bureaucrats. You know, you're not supposed to hate a civic servant, but they did because they're known as chinovniks. And the chinovniks were these people were there to simply, you know, uh, make a living, to, to get what, they had no sense of patriot. They may be Armenian, but they had no sense of patriotism, no sense of loyalty, except for themselves. They may still exist, I don't know. But these um, chinovniks, uh, these complaints, uh, of the Chinook saying, you know, and, and, and Parliament, the parliamentarians are saying, you know, we are being judged by the people, by the face of those people who are called Chinooks, and unless we get rid of those people, uh, the government, the people will never have any confidence in us. So these were the kinds of debates that were going on in, in there, and the need to, uh, to, to transfer from Russian style administration to an Armenian administration based not on imperial rule, but on, on local government. Uh, the Western Armenians, the Turkish Armenians, are really a pain here. Uh, uh, yes, you had different societies in the Caucasus that tried to help these poor people, but they also are destroying our own uh, agricultural infrastructure. They're also uh, taking over our fields and stealing our food and so forth. And the, and the Western Armenians were even more bitter. They didn't like the Russian Armenians who sp spiced their language with Russian terminology, who, who were raised in the, the Russian milieu uh, and felt that these people were not uh, patriotic at all because the Western Armenians considered themselves uh, highly patriotic. And you know what it reminds me? Uh, the first time I came to Armenia in, well, now, how many years ago? <laughs> 1959, to be a matter of fact, 1959. And I uh, met people, families, who had come from Syria and Lebanon 10, 12 years earlier. And that was the same complaint. They were bitter about Deratsinere. That they have no national sense, they have no patriotism, no patriot, well, yeah. patriotic feeling, so on and so forth. So here it is again, repete, happening in the same, the same sense uh, was there in 1918, 1919, that uh, the, these people are really not patriots uh, like we are. Uh, and so how do you, how do you uh, bridge that divide? And of course, only time would bridge that divide, and perhaps a new, uh, a new generation being born would, uh, would be able to do that. Well, there's much to be said, and I, and I can't say it. Uh, uh, there were uh, small steps taken amid the chaos. Um, repairs to the telegraph system. Uh, repairs to the railway. The Armenian Railway Administration began with two locomotives and maybe 30 rattly freight cars because all of these uh, trains, when during the Turkish invasion, all of them had been sent to Tiflis, to Georgia, and elsewhere for safekeeping, but then the Armenians didn't get them back. And so they were left with nothing for a railway. But during that period of the coalition government, the beginning of the restoration of the transportation system, train service restored between Yerevan and Sanahin, and ultimately to Tiflis, between Alexandropol and Kars, and ultimately to Sarakhamish. Uh, so these kinds of steps, little steps that probably people didn't feel at all, or felt very little if they're hungry and have difficulties. Nonetheless, these steps were being <laughs> made. And particularly what was interesting is that uh, even at this time, Armenian specialists from other parts of Russia were making their way toward Yerevan. And the government was utilizing their expertise in mineralogy and geology uh, plan. So it was a, they were even in the midst of 
this chaos, they were making plans for the future. And if the state had survived, one might think that these would have laid the groundwork for a, a really a, a flourishing, a flourishing economy. Um, one of the weakest points um, of the Armenian government in this period or throughout its history uh, was the army. Not the, not the rank and file, but the command. The Armenian command, um, the general staff and uh, commanding officers had come through the Russian academies. They were used to Russian military on a large scale imperial um, level and not local little country to be directors and commanders of a little country, of a little army composed of ragtag people who were on the front lines continuously. I mean, it was no fun being a soldier. I mean, we, we talk about Sardarabad and Bashar and Ayo, but what about this daily, daily struggle of these people, of Muslim uh, enclaves 10 miles from Yerevan, in Beirut Vedi, Vedi Bazar, and onward, around Etchmiazin, near the railroads of Etchmiazin. All the Muslim villages are in, refuses to allow an Armenian uh, representative or, or official uh, into there, and the army on constant alert and always struggling and fighting on every front with very four provisions and in cold. Without, without top coats. That, that's on its own, but I'm talking now about the leadership, the command. Uh, they never really, well, with exceptions, they never really transferred from the mentality of a Russian military officer to becoming an Armenian leader close to your soldiers. Uh, Gentleman asked about Armenians at cars in 1920 and the loss of cars. Well, who was the commander? The commander was General Hovsepov, Hovsepov, Osipov, or Hovsepian, who during the entire campaign sat in his wagon, in his uh, military car, never went to the front line, never, never had a hands-on thing, and the opposite, the, on the other side was his brilliant, brilliant strategist, known as General Karabekir Pasha, who, was, who, who outsmarted the Armenians in every way. And again, if you have to blame, don't blame the rank and file, the poor Armenian soldier who finally gave up and fled, shamefully, shamefully fled from cars. But the lack of that cohesion uh, that could be, should be created in a small national army. That small national army never came to fruition, and the Armenian government didn't have time to retrain these people or to train new people uh, for that kind of situation. Well, um, the, the coalition lasted um, for from six years, six months or so. Uh, ultimately, it uh, collapsed, and um, ironically, it collapsed over this picture that you see. And this is the picture of the first anniversary of the Armenian Republic, the parade held in Yerevan on May 28, 1919. Um, it was a, a wonderful day. Uh, they even had floats. You know what floats are, these things, you know. They were drawn by, um, probably by tractors. They had a couple of tractors here. And the first float had on it, um, uh, draped in black, um, and with the names of the provinces of Western Armenia, Karpert and Garin and Van and Mosh and so forth. So, and dressed in daras in the, in the clothing of the Western Armenians. Um, the first float, went that way, that is the lost territories of uh, Armenia. And, and then the second float was one of 
celebration in which uh, a child of Western Armenian clothing and one in Eastern Armenian clothing, holding hands, clasping, uh, a symbol of the future, of the bright future of Armenia, with scouts all along the way and, and celebrations. And it's interesting that I, I found here, as I went back and looked at my, uh, my Republic of Armenia, uh, that already in the first year, it's, I found that interesting, uh, is that Bashabaran and uh, Karakilise and Sardarabad were already being lionized uh, in the Armenian mind. The person in charge of the uh, celebrations of May 28 was the Jolgurtagan, um, Democratic Minister of Education or Culture, uh, Kevork Melik Karagozian. And, uh, and he, uh, in, in preparation for the celebration of uh, the first anniversary, he uh, sent out a, a declaration in which he said, uh, passing before you were the Turkish hordes, which enveloped your fields, devastated your villages and cities, slaughtered your parents and children, carried away your brothers and sisters. With its exhausted forces, the Armenian people bled white by countless wounds and left unaided armed only with faith in his sacred cause and with strength of soul, bravely withstood the infamous enemy and brought glory to the nation at the battles of Sardarabad, Bashabaran, and Karakilisa. Let the day of May 28 be a memorial to our martyrs, but let it also be an all national day of rejoicing, day of the creation of a new government around biblical Ararat, day of triumph of noble Armenian aspirations and of international justice. Um, at the day of celebration of May 28, at the decision of the government, Alexander Khatisyan uh, read a declaration that had been signed by the entire cabinet, including the populist or Jovurtagan ministers. It was a declaration of united Armenia, he declared that henceforth the government would represent all of Armenia, not just Yerevan and the Eastern people. And he said, to restore the integrality of Armenia and to secure the complete freedom and prosperity of her people, the government of Armenia, abiding by the solid will and desire of the entire Armenian nation, declares that from this day forward, the divided parts of Armenia are everlastingly combined as an independent political entity. And we continue. We continue. Now, in promulgating this act of unification and independence of the ancestral Armenian lands, located in Transcaucasia and the Ottoman Empire, the government of Armenia dictate, declares that the political system of United Armenia is a democratic republic and that it has become the government of the United Republic of Armenia. Thus, the people of Armenia are henceforth the supreme lord and master of this consolidated fatherland and the parliament and government of Armenia stand at the supreme, as a supreme legislature and executive authority, conjoining the free people of United Armenia. Um, this was a declaration that even though Armenia had not really been united, even though the lands uh, uh, of Western Armenia still remained occupied by the Turkish armies, uh, it was justified on the fact that Armenia had to declare or to show itself on the international arena that it stood to represent all the Armenian people in a united land and that hopefully with the assistance of the allied powers who would fulfill their pledges that Western Armenia would soon be occupied uh, by uh, the Armenian forces and our united Armenia would come to fruition. Now, on the surface, it seems like a wonderful declaration. But in reality, it caused uh, the collapse of the coalition government. Even though uh, 
the, the, the Democratic uh, Tagan ministers had signed the declaration, when it became known to the Central Committee in Tiflis of the party, the party center was still there, uh, there was a strong a protest uh, because they felt that uh, the government in Yerevan had usurped powers that it should not have done because it did not take into consideration uh, the sentiments of Bolos Nubar, the head of the Armenian National Delegation in Paris, that had been done unilaterally and without consultation. Uh, and uh, at the beginning of June, Samson Harutunyan, the very same minister who looked for judicial reform, announced that the populist party, uh, the People's Party, would withdraw from the government. Khatisyan tried to explain the reasons that it was necessary for that declaration and the fact that uh, Melik Karagozian himself had led the May 28th events and the populist ministers had themselves signed it, but it was of no avail because also by that time, within a few days, Boas Nubar in Paris, who was heading the Armenian de delegation, uh, felt en enormously insulted um, that the Yerevan government, the so-called Ararajan Republic, as Western Armenians referred to it frequently, had uh, declared this on its own. Uh, and even more perhaps um, painful was that later in that month, just before national elections, for a first time nationally elected parliament were to take place, the Populist Party, uh, People's Party, uh, declared a boycott of the election, uh, and uh, the election went forward without the only real liberal party that could draw around it uh, the Armenian moneyed classes, bourgeoisie, professional, intellectual classes. So uh, this was a blow to the development of the infrastructure uh, of Armenia. Nonetheless, that election took place without the populist uh, People's Party. Uh, and it's interesting that in, the, in drawing up the uh, statutes for election, it was a very liberal um, statute based probably on the socialist ideology and liberal ideology of the European socialist and liberal parties. And that is, it was... Uh, to be direct election, it was to be a proportional representation without intervening stages of uh, election. Uh, all citizens of Armenia and all residents of Armenia were eligible to vote regardless of race, religion, uh, men and women, age 18 or older. And again, you can, this is an enormously progressive uh, concept when you remember that many countries still had not given women the right to vote. The United States was just moving to the culmination of the suffragette movement at the same time. And France, as I remember, didn't give women the vote until World War II, a generation later. So this is what we're finding is whether it was fully implemented or not, whether the election was uh, really democratic or not, it's a statement of where they wanted to go, what they believed in. And it was also significant, uh, maybe it was just um, window dressing, but nonetheless also it was a statement, the fact that on the uh, ARF list of, of representatives, three women, were uh, elected uh, to the first parliament of Armenia. Three women, uh, that's not a great number, just as today you don't have a great number. As I look around the Armenian parliament, I don't see a lot of women, uh, uh, or in many other parliaments. But nonetheless, here we are back in 1919, making the statement that women have the right to vote and women can be seated in parliament. And three Muslims, 
representing the minority population, Muslim population, were also elected uh, to the parliament uh, in uh, 1919. Uh, the uh, parliament after the uh, Jean Bortagan withdrawal, with Cartesian in the middle, included um, uh, civic figures, uh, two of them in the middle, Gulkhantanyan and Araradyan, had been leaders of the Armenian community of Baku, the Armenian National Council of Baku, and to the um, left is Nikola Balyan, who was really a, a wonderful intellectual and dreamed big dreams about uh, enlightenment in Armenia. And that, under his uh, direction, under his direction, uh, the number of elementary schools in Armenia jumped from 130 in 1918 school year to more than 300 uh, one year later. And his goal was ultimately to have 900 schools with a five-year uh, liberal curriculum of uh, history, philology, uh, Armenian history, uh, and so forth. And probably the crowning, uh, his crowning achievement of Avbalian in January of 1920 was to bring to fruition the opening of the first Armenian university uh, of Armenia in uh, the city, uh, because there were no uh, available buildings here in Yerevan, they were filled either with refugees or uh, uh, other uh, essential places. For the time being, they used a, a major institute in Alexandropol, and the Armenian University was opened in Alexandropol uh, with the intent that it should move to Yerevan uh, the following year. And the, uh, it was a modest, they started with, I think, uh, two or three faculties in philology and history uh, and science, uh, and they brought to it, again, intellectuals of, of very high uh, standing. Uh, and it's also interesting that both in the government and in the educational institutions, uh, party loyalties were not uh, the primary criteria for selection, but ability. All the ministries that were head, headed by the Tashnak Shushun, for example, uh, employed socialist revolutionaries, socialist democrats, Joel Dagan people, and based on uh, based on their ability. And so I give them uh, credit uh, for that. At the opening ceremony, uh, Holoness Tumanyan had sent a very, very moving uh, welcome, and in his speech, uh, uh, Albalian stressed that uh, while Armenia still needed to hold the sword in one hand, the time had come for it to grip the pen with the other, the sword and the pen, and that it was time also to focus on enlightenment and education uh, of, of the population. Uh, this is he, Albalian. So at the end of the first year of the Republic, you can see that it had expanded from that very small area uh, up to um, uh, the uh, Tiflis Gubernia of Georgia and uh, westward into Kars. And you'll see a little area uh, to the west um, where the Armenian uh, government had still not been able to extend its uh, control of Olti, the area of Olti, which is a Kurdish populated area, and it was very difficult for the Armenians. And here they, here the Armenian um, differences came into uh, effect. Uh, Alexander Khatisyan, through his whole premiership, believed in gradualism, believed in toleration, believed that they should not force the Muslim minority with arms into submission, but rather should use friendly persuasion by selecting Muslim officials in Muslim populated areas to making them feel, feel secure in the Republic of Armenia and make them understand that it's not an Armenian Republic not an Armenian Republic, but a Republic of Armenia, and that they are citizens of that Republic, no matter what their um, religion or their uh, ethnic national uh, origins. 
The other side, of course, was, was Terminasyan, who believed that only force, that the Muslim minority can only understand the language of fire, and that that fire should be applied. These came to a head, eventually. At the ninth general meeting, Antanu Zhorov, Hai Harapa Uchan, Inerort Antanu Zhorov, or Devonesa Leister, Azad Hayastani Mech, Hazanin Ardasini Amrana. It had took place here in Yerevan. For the first time, the ARF was meeting in its own free state. It had never done that before. And it was a, an important meeting where strategies had to be re recalculated. And for the first time, for the first time in 1919, the ARF adopted the platform or the plank of a free, independent, united Armenia. Up until that time, it had never declared for an independent Armenia. Only after it was an established fact did the party now catch up uh, by declaring that it favored that. There were in this um, meeting Western Armenians, Eastern Armenians, and that uh, dualism continued on. The Western Armenians were very resentful of the dominant Eastern Armenian, Russian Armenians, socialist Armenians, because they came from the peasant background and wanting to um, uh, work with the uh, people uh, for the advancement uh, of their rights without playing on international socialistic concepts. Uh, but even more uh, pronounced was the question of what should be the role of the party in the policy of the state. There were those, like Terminasyan, who insisted that the government had to be submissive in every way to the decisions of the executive board of the party that is known as the Bureau. The Supreme Bureau of the party is supposed to carry out the decisions of the General Congress, of the General Meeting. Well, there are different ways of carrying it out. And people like Terminasyan and the sort of the extremists, uh, the militants, insisted that the party had to dominate the cabinet and the parliament, and there should be no movement away from that. The liberals on the other side, such, such as Khatisan himself, insisted that, yes, the party has a role and the bureau has a role in giving the general scheme of things and the general direction in which the party should go in government and in parliament, but it should not dictate day to day uh, what should be done, and there should be a degree of decentralization enjoyed both by the cabinet and the uh, parliament. Uh, this came to a head uh, on the following issue. If a bureau member became also a member of government, could he have these two positions? I mean, this is, the, uh, the enemies, of course, called this the Soviet system, where the head of the party and head of the state, uh, state and party are one. Uh, and the liberals said, no, uh, uh, no, we shouldn't do that, and they prevailed. And the, and the prevailing decision was that if any member of this seven-member bureau they're powerful figures, should enter into the government, they immediately had to cease their membership in the Bureau. You're a member of one or the other, but not of both. Now that may have been pro forma, maybe they would still have influence, but it nonetheless was making a statement of a degree of decentralization uh, which, uh, which prevailed uh, at the uh, Antonio Zhov. They also, uh, chastised the Armenian government for not taking more active measures to bring Karabakh uh, into the fold of the boundaries of the Armenian Republic 
and it was probably one of the, uh, one of the reasons that the party bureau thereafter uh, sent agents into Karabakh to raise a rebellion against Azerbaijani control, uh, which was not all that happy ending, but uh, it comes from this ninth meeting. Um, to the left, you see um, a third prime minister after Khatisyan, uh, Hamo or Hamazas Bohanjanyan, and to the right, you find this hardliner, uh, Rupen Terminasyan, who believed in uh, fire and brimstone as the only answer to bring submission of those elements that did not want to recognize uh, the Armenian Republic, pay taxes, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> let me, uh, so let me go back here. Uh, in the end, in the end, uh, Armenia, the Armenian government, violated the principles of the Ninth Party Congress. And uh, Ruben Derminasian had his way. In uh, this May of 1920, I'm not even looking at the watch you gave me. Uh, in May of 1920, there took place um, in a, a demonstration here in Yerevan on May Day, May 1st. That demonstration came immediately after the Red Army had marched into Baku on April 28th in a bloodless coup in Azerbaijan. A coup that had been engineered with the support of Mustafa Kemal and the Turkish nationalists who wanted to see a Sovietized Azerbaijan in order to be able to open a corridor between Soviet Russia and the nationalist movement of Eastern Turkey, which was defying the Western powers in every way and trying to tear apart any agreement that would cede Turkish Ottoman territory to any other government, whether they be Greeks or Armenians or others. Uh, and their plan was with Azerbaijan Sovietized, it would then be much easier to move through Karabakh into Zangazur, into Nakhichevan, and directly into Turkey. They would have a direct pipeline because the sea was not safe. <coughs> British warships were in the Black Sea. It was a hostile zone, so they needed a land route to connect with each other. Two revolutionary regimes of Soviet Russia and nationalist, Kemalist Turkey. Uh, that event inspired a very small number of Armenian Bolsheviks to follow suit in thinking that with the Red Army now in Azerbaijan, and with the fatigue and exhaustion of the Armenian army, and the dissatisfaction of the public on many issues, it might be just the right time to try to stage a coup or a coup-looking uprising in Armenia and invite the Red Army immediately to come to the assistance. There had been created in Armenia a small communist organization. Uh, they, in the whole country, even by, even by, in Soviet literature, the number of sympathizers and Bolsheviks they give in the whole country was 500. I doubt it was even that. But they did have what was known as the Armenkom, the Armenian Committee of the Communist Party. And in that, two or three very young firebrand revolutionaries, one of whom had been a young Tashnatsagan, had been expelled and hated the ARF, and wanted vengeance. His name was Avis, Avis Nurijanyan. Uh, they were able, uh, on May Day, you know, May Day is the International uh, Labor Day of Celebration, they were able to mount small counter-demonstrations here in Yerevan, 
and in Alexandropol, where there was the greatest dissatisfaction among the workers of Alexandropol uh, because of wages. E there were economic bases for, for dissatisfaction. And over the first two weeks of May, they tried to arouse the military forces to either turn against the government or to take a neutral stance. And they were successful in some areas under a captain Musaelian, Sarkis Musaelian, uh, to take over the armored, the, the armored, the Armenia had an armored train, uh, to take it over and um, put it at the disposal of this revolutionary committee. These minor <coughs> flares and upheavals took much of the month of May, not coordinated at all, in one town after another. They lasted a day, two days, three days, but they were sufficient to destabilize the government and uh, to demoralize the army. When we talk about cars in October, the army, army had become demoralized in this period of May uh, the May. Uh, it was then that the Bureau of the Tashnaftichun joined the government throughout Khatisyan and all his ministers and inserted the entire Bureau as the government of Armenia, led by Ohan Janyan, a native of Akhakalak, and Rupen Derminasyan also from uh, that area, Akhakalak, Akhutsakh area who uh, believe now in iron fist. And um, not only did they punish the leaders of the army and some of the armed forces, but they also now turned the wrath of whatever loyal military forces they had. And in this case, the most loyal military forces were again the Western Armenian units, the Turkish Armenian units, under their Khambabids, under Sampad and under Cebu, turning against, now turning them against the south, I don't know if I have it here, no, um, uh, uh, southward uh, toward Vedi Bazar, toward Zangi Bazar, Vedi Bazar, all the way to uh, the gates of Julfa. And in the summer of 1919, uh, I'm sorry, summer of 1920, uh, when this forceful minister took over, thousands and thousands of Muslim refugees, after defending very valiantly their enclaves with the support of Turkish officers and Turkish artillery, which had been smuggled into these areas for defense, they ran over Bedi Bazar, they ran over Zangi Bazar, and these people took flight into Turkey, and it's then when you have a great deal of Turkish propaganda about, again about Armenian massacres and pogroms uh, of the defenseless Muslim population. And they reached all the way to the gates of Nakhichevan. It was their ultimate wish, desire, to get to Nakhichevan and open the railway that went all the way to the border of Iran at Jofa. If they could reopen that railway from Yerevan to Julfa, they would have a new lifeline because the only lifeline they had now was through Georgia and that lifeline was not very reliable. And so they got almost to Nakhichevan when Red Army detachments coming from Karabakh over Zangizur into Nakhichevan, now joined with Turkish detachments coming from, uh, from Bayazid area. And you now had a Turkish, Soviet, Red Army, Turkish Nationalist combined unit blocking the Armenians. And the Turks were very brilliant. They put red lapels, the soldiers all had red lapels uh, uh, here because they were revolutionary Soviet style, and that is to pull the eyes wool over the eyes of the Soviets, making them think that they too are revolutionary and therefore a single cause. 
So <clears throat> the year 1918 or 1920 uh, ends rather mixed. Uh, enormous progress. First time since 1914. How many years is that? Six. First time in six years that all of the fields of Armenia have been planted in grain. There is a major program helped by the American Relief to purchase seed grain, wheat grain, from the Crimea and southern Russia, bringing it here into Armenia so that the peasants could plant their crops in the spring of 1920 in anticipation of a full, first time, a, a full crop here. Uh, intellectuals, specialists continuing to come into Armenia, and Western Armenian refugees who were in, caught up in the Russian Civil War <clears throat> from the areas of Krasnodar and Navarasisk and uh, Vladikavkaz, making their way into the Republic, <clears throat> pushing toward the borders of cars in anticipation. And if that had become reality, you know, I sometimes fantasize. In 1920, delegations of lost Armenians came from Hungary, they came from Poland, they came from other areas, they had lost their Armenian identity 200 years earlier, 300 years earlier. They had an Armenian Bible in their homes. They had become Roman Catholic. And yet, you know, the, the blood seems to speak. And when they learned that there might be a united Armenian state, they sent their delegations to Yerevan to say, you know, when this happens, we're prepared to create movements of our people to our historic homelands. And the Armenian diaspora of 1920 was not the Armenian diaspora today. They were people who were yearning to return. They were yearning to return from Fresno and Worcester and Boston and from Paris and from Marseille and from the refugee centers of Aleppo and so forth. And if that had become a reality, the picture today would be entirely different. But history was not kind. History was not kind. And as we will see Friday, we look at Armenia on the international scene. What is it that the Armenians wanted? What right did they have to want those things? And how did it ultimately turn out? And then ultimately, maybe let's think together about how should we assess uh, all of this as the experiment of restoration of Armenian statehood uh, after so many centuries of Armenians being subjects of other empires. Thank you.